lunch now, and then we'll be back at 1.45 in the main room. So our next speaker is Phil Barrett, and uh, Phil is from is it Flow Interactive. And uh, Phil's going to be talking to us about what your customers really think, incorporating usability testing into Agile. So uh, a few words about Phil. He's the director of Flow Interactive, a leading UX design consultancy in Cape Town. He started Flow in London in 1998 and has worked with organizations including the BBC, LastMinute.com, Vodafone, Old Mutual, Mixit, and Suntum. He helps Agile teams increase their impact by understanding what customers want and coming up with great designs to help them get it. He also delivers regular training courses in UX design and in product management. So let's welcome Phil, and Phil, it's all yours. Am I going to need to use a microphone? Yes. Yeah? My, my powers of projection are not, not good enough. All right, microphone it is. Here we go. Hello, hello. Yes, okay. Cool, thanks for coming. It's really nice. I thought nobody would come. I thought I'd be talking to an empty room, so it's really nice to be here. And um, I'm going to be talking at terrific speed about the massive topic of how you work with users and squeezing it into half an hour. So pay attention. Okay, so who am I and what, what right have I got to talk about this? Well, as I say, I work for a company called Flow. We've been doing it for a very long time. In South Africa, these are some of our clients and all of these clients have run usability tests or we've run usability tests with them or for them and so we must have learned something along the way. Um, so I'm going to kind of ease us into the topic of, of <coughs> user feedback um, and I went and I googled for um, top new startups of 2014 and I got things like ThinkUp, Analytics for Humans or Genius, Annotate the World or Your Phone Evolved and I stared at these for a while and I thought sure what these do. Um, so have you done things like this where somebody said, go to a website, try out this thing, have a go at it, see what you think. And you go there and, and you sort of look at it and you think, <laughs> and then you just sort of look off. <laughs> because really, what, what, what is this for? What you don't do is write a letter like this. Dear sir or madam, I recently visited your new website. I must confess that at first I found it a bit difficult to understand the value you were offering, etc., etc. And then you go on to list um, in detail exactly what they should do to fix it. You don't do that. You just say, meh, and you wander off. So, who is sending you feedback about your product that you're making? Let's think about the kinds of people who are out there. Well, up this axis, let's see if my little red glowing thing will work, there we go. Up this axis, you've got different kinds of users, people who are just trying your product for the first time, casual users, confirmed users, or evangelists, beta users, who are very passionate about your product. Over here, you've got people who've got no opinion, or a bit of an opinion, or a very strong opinion. So, who's going to bother to send you some feedback? Well, I reckon the curve is like that. It's either people who have an enormously strong opinion, or people who are already evangelists of your product, the blue bit. And people who are not going to send you any feedback is the white bit. Yeah? They're not going to spontaneously sit down and write you a six-paragraph piece of feedback because they're just saying, meh, can't really be bothered. Well, this is a problem because that means there's a huge chunk of feedback you should be getting as an agile team that you're not getting because the users are saying meh. Um, and if we, this is a very famous graph, yeah, build, measure, learn from a lean startup. And if we break learn, if learn isn't working properly, then we don't get a circle or a cycle, we just get a sort of a build, measure, learn, and then we didn't really learn anything because the users didn't really tell us anything because we didn't know how to ask, and then we wander off and we start making stuff. And it might be the right stuff or it might be the wrong stuff on the next iteration. How do we really know? So I spoke to a guy the other day who said, oh yes, we were working on a software project for three and a half years. Um, and um, they kept cancelling the usability testing. And then eventually after three and a half years, we tested it on consumers and they didn't understand a word of it. And that was three and a half years worth of iterative software development, which had never been user tested, um, which was pretty much a waste of space. 
So this is a thing that's been bugging me recently, yeah, which is that in Agile, in an Agile project, you make a little change. You do a sprint, you add some features, and then you say, okay, well, we've only added a little bit to the user interface, so we won't need to check that with users, because it's so little that we can't really, you know, it's nothing to ask them. So we'll just bank that, and we'll carry on. We'll add a, another little bit later, and add another little bit. And you are a bit like a lobster in that situation. You're in the water, the water starts off cool, and it gets slightly hotter every time, yeah? It's slightly hotter. You, you've added more and more features. Your software hasn't been seen by users for more and more, or fed back on properly by users for, for more and more time. And eventually, you get boiled, and you didn't even really realize it was happening. So because of the incremental nature of Agile, we're at risk of not, uh, of not really understanding what our users want quick enough to be able to be really Agile. So what do we do? How do we learn? What does it mean to learn if we're saying build, measure, and learn? So obviously, we've got web analytics, and we've got tracking. We've got uh, click tracking, or uh, you know, things like Crazy Egg, or whatever. Um, and that's great, good stuff. It tells you what people do with your product. And that's wonderful, and it's lying there, and all good Agile teams are checking their analytics when they release, and that's what's splendid. It's hard data. Um, the trouble with that is that it doesn't really tell you why people are doing what they do. They go to places on your site, they use features of your product, they do stuff, but you don't really know why, they just do it. So a while back, a car company called us in and said, um, we've got a form, it's the book a test drive form, and it's got a 99.9% .9 bounce rate. Everybody who goes there, the analytics tell us, bounce off that form. It must be a dreadful form. Can you come and check the usability of that form, please? So we came and we tested the form, and the form was completely fine. There was nothing wrong with it. It was quite good. What was going on? Well, if you ordered a brochure from the website, you came to a page that said, thank you very much for ordering a brochure. If you'd like to book a test drive, click here. And there was no other navigation on the page. So everybody bought, uh, ordered a brochure, read, thank you, click here, clicked here, and got to the book a test drive form, which was not what they wanted, so they all backed out. So the analytics said everybody bounces off the form. But when we worked with users, we could understand why. It's because actually nobody wanted to be funneled to the form in the first place. So analytics doesn't tell you why. Split testing, fantastic, yeah? You can ask people, well, would you prefer this or would you prefer that? That's really good. But the issue there is, well, what if you um, have given them two rubbish options? What if that you can choose between this thing which doesn't address your needs or this other thing, which also doesn't address your needs, which one are you going to convert more with? And then the answer is kind of arbitrary. So usability testing, where you sit with actual humans and try to do some face-to-face -face work with them, gives you a whole different kind of user feedback. Analytics is great, split testing is great, usability testing sitting on top gives you awesome superpowers. So with usability testing, you can see why people do what they do. You can ask them, oh, why did you do that? Or what do you think that button does? Or what is it that you're trying to achieve round about now? And they can actually tell you, and you can understand why. And that gives you a fantastic opportunity to innovate. You can say, oh my goodness, people need this. Of course, now I see. Or, oh my goodness, people don't understand this idea at all. Now I see. And you can actually move forward much more productively. So all good, all good ways of learning. Usability testing is what I'm talking about really today, though. And here's a picture of a very high glamour usability test where you all get to sit in a darkened room behind a one-way mirror and watch as some poor soul or some collection of poor souls works through your software and tries it out. Um, and it's an amazing experience. In fact, sitting in the dark room, if you watch product teams sitting in the dark room looking through the mirror and watching people try out their product, it's a bit like watching live sport. Yeah. They, you can watch them and they kind of sit there and they're just chatting, maybe eating a peanut, nothing much going on. And then suddenly something interesting happens and the user's got to solve a task and the mouse goes towards the right button and the team's going, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so, so it can be fun, but it can also be a bit of a performance in the, in the darkened room there. So it depends. It can be useful to do a bit of usability theatre in a darkened room like that sometimes if you, uh, if you have got some stakeholders to but many of you are sitting in the audience saying, no, I don't need 
we're sticking feedback, this is a load of rubbish, yeah, this is user feedback nonsense, we don't need it, yeah. I know what my customers want, you believe this in your heart, I know what my, my what people want, and my software is good. I mean, look at it, it's good, it is good software, so I don't need any feedback. And anyway, there's no point in asking customers because they don't know what they want either. So let us address these common misconceptions. The first one, I know what people want. Okay, statistical proof that you don't. Um, this was part of some very good research done by a couple of guys, including Jacob Nielsen, he of usability fame, where they measured how long it took people to do things. And what they found was on website, on websites, it takes um, the slowest 25% of users take two and a half times as long as the fastest 25% of users. The fact that you are here at an agile software development conference means you are the fastest 25% of users. Yeah? You're the green gang, you are the best, you are the smarty pants. And most of your customers are not as clever as you. They're not. Okay? And even if they're as clever as you, they're not as good with computers as you. Because they haven't had as much practice, because you spend all day fiddling around with a mouse and whatever it is. So you are not there. <clears throat> Um, and then there's this other thing, right, which is that we tend to think that users are these perfectly calculating, optimal decision makers who do the logical thing, who read every page that you put in front of them, who explore thoroughly, and all that sort of stuff. Whereas, in fact, human beings really, when you, when you watch them and talk to them and, and see how they behave, they tend to be very emotional about stuff, they tend to take all the shortcuts they can possibly take, and they tend to be quite emotional. So you are, of course, you're all like the guy on the left, aren't you? So you wouldn't understand that weirdly, mm -hmm. right? Um, okay, next one then. My software is good. Look, it's good. I really don't need any work, any help from users because my software is good. So um, there's a fairly famous uh, 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 cognitive bias, so piece of irrational behavior, uh, which was documented by a fairly famous guy called Dan Ariely. Um, and the idea was, well, here's how we found out about it, or how we proved it. He set up a stand at the university where he works, and he asked people at that stand to make origami frogs. And origami frogs are very hard to make, as you can see. You have to do a hell of a lot of folding. You will make a bad origami frog on your first attempt. It is guaranteed, and that's why he chose it. What he wanted to know was, okay, once you have made an origami frog, how much will you bid to take that frog home with you? Um, will, you, uh, will you bid you know, 10 cents or 50 cents or whatever, up to a dollar, to take that frog home with you? And how much would you bid to take home somebody else's manky frog with a, with a gammy leg? And how much would you bid to take home an expert frog, beautifully crafted by an origami master? Well, as some of you may well know, what he found was um, that the average bid for an expert frog is 27 cents, and the average bid for your own frog is 23 cents, and the average bid for somebody else's lame and hopeless frog is 5 cents. <laughs> so what we can say is that when you make something, you value it more highly than you should. And in fact, this can be exploited in all sorts of wonderful ways, like when you make your Twitter profile or when you make your Facebook profile. Uh, you value it more than perhaps you should. And Harvard, Harvard Business School did their research on it and found, yeah, this, this guy here, John Gorville, found that basically entrepreneurs and project managers and project owners tend to overvalue um, what they're doing by a factor of three, and people who uh, are already using an existing product tend to overvalue how good the existing product is by a factor of three, and when you multiply them together, you get nine. He called it the nine times problem. The fact that basically teams are nine times more optimistic than they should be about how good their software really is. <laughs> so, you are suffering from that now and you don't even know it. <laughs> and last one, customers don't know what they want. So, customers, customers don't know what they want. Yeah, if you ask customers what they want, they'll say, I want the, the, the present, but with wings on it. Um, and that's why weird sci-fi from the 50s and the 30s look so peculiar, because the people who drew those were being very unimaginative, actually, about what the future would really be like. So we are, provably, as human beings, bad at imagining the future. And so if you ask people what they want, they'll tell you that the present with wings. And there's a very famous image to do with don't ask customers what they want, which is the Homer Simpson car, yeah? So the Homer Simpson car is ridiculous. If you ask Homer Simpson what he wants the ideal car to be, it's ludicrous. 
Um, but actually, if you look at what Homer Simpson is saying there, he's come up with some really awesome ideas, and he has some very good requirements there. So he's got two domes, yeah, one for the parents and one for the children in the car. The children are in a separate glass dome at the back of the car, right? Now, that's ridiculous, except if you try to analyse the job that Homer is trying to say he wants done, he wants his children to not bother him on the journey. He wants a peaceful journey. And actually, if you look at that and you say, well, why did you make a dome? What were you really trying to tell me you wanted? Um, you can get really useful requirements. So typically, users will tell you, I want some crazy glass dome. But underneath that, there's a meaningful requirement. There's a job that they do want to get done. That job is usually fairly well understood. So you need to read through what your users are telling. Uh, and also, you need to watch what they do. Yeah? So this is Homer, um, Jacob Nielsen, not Homer Simpson, Jacob Nielsen. Um, and this is one of his very famous quotes, to design an easy to use interface, pay attention to what users do, not to what they say. So you can't rely on what they say they need, but if you watch what they actually do, you can learn a lot. So watching what users do, that's what we're talking about. And this is not Jacob Nielsen, nor is it Homer Simpson. Uh, this is Jared Spool, who's an awesome, awesome guy, comes from a software background and writes a lot about user experience design. And he says, there is a direct correlation between the number of hours that each team member is exposed directly to real users and the improvements we see in the designs. It's the closest thing we've found to a silver bullet. Cool, okay, so that's the background about usability testing. 15 gone. So what does that mean I've got left? Uh, 15 left? I haven't done well. Okay. Okay, so let's make it incredibly easy. So part of persuading people to do things, right, is to motivate them, and I hope I've motivated you, and then to make it really easy. So I'm now going to try and make it as easy as possible for you to understand how to go away and conduct a usability test. Okay. So, <clears throat> there are five steps in this little introduction and then a few extra questions and answers. The first one is, you will need an interface. You can't use ability tests if you don't have an interface. The interface doesn't have to be finished code, and we'll talk about that, but you will need something to test. And then you will need to work out what are the key tasks that users should uh, try to carry out on this interface. So, if you're a Lean UX fan, you might well have a hypothesis floating around that says, we believe that users really want to do this. Well, let's list some of the thises that we want them to do. Okay, next, you need to get a user. Um, this little space alien is from a movie uh, called Lifted by, I think it's Pixar. Um, so you want to ask that user to try doing some of the tasks and to think aloud as they do them, which isn't very hard once you've got them relaxed, give them a cup of tea again. Okay. Your job is to not interfere at all. You just need to sit there and write things down, keep a track of what's going on, and just let your user think through what it is that they're doing. Maybe every now and then you'll say, so what are you thinking around about now if they go a bit quiet on you? Otherwise, just kind of leave them to it. And then at some point, they will ask the trickiest question of all, which is, am I doing this right? What does that button do? I'm not sure. Am I okay here? And they'll start asking you, which is great. When they start asking you, it means you found something that causes some concern, so note that. But also then just flip the question back to them and just ask them, well, what do you think the button does? Which means you have to be weird but friendly. And then the last thing you need to do is keep a record, because what will happen in this thing is a lot. You will see a lot of stuff happening very quickly clicks and motions and conversations and thoughts and ideas and it won't seem quick until a few minutes later when you realize that you can't remember what the hell just happened. So keep a record of it and there's lots of ways you can do that. Um, you can use Camtasia, you can use Silverback, you can use QuickTime, you can use EvoCam, there are lots of screen recording things you can do where you can also record audio. So keep a, keep a recording so that you can review what the heck just happened and also share it with your team. So that's it. That is a usability test. You need to go and do one of those. Um, the trickiest bit is this bit where you're trying to not influence your user. Because if you say to the user, um, please click on the search button, and they click on the search button, 
You haven't really learned anything, yeah? Or if you say to them, you like this software, don't you? And they say, oh yes, then you haven't really learned anything. You need to make sure you influence them as little as possible. And obviously you'll still influence them because you're sitting in a room next to them. But you want to try and minimize that effect. So instead of saying, do you like this, where you're implanting the idea of you like this in their heads, you say, what do you think? Does this annoy you? How does this make you feel? Do you understand this? Tell me what this is for. Do you want this? That's the hardest one. When will you use this is the closest you can get. And do you usually do this? Well there, that's a whole other kind of research where you're trying to find out what behavior people have exhibited in the past. So there, you flip it around and you say, tell me the story of the last time you did this. Not what do you usually do, um, what might you do, what does your brother-in-law do, what could you do, but what did you actually do last time? And that makes quite a difference. So you're looking for open questions, yeah? Do you like this becomes what do you think? Or do you understand this becomes what is this for? So that the answers aren't yes, no answers, and they're also not answers that lead people. And that takes practice. So if you do in your first usability test, you'll probably say quite a few of these, and every time you do, you'll kick yourself under the desk, but you'll just keep going, because that's the kind of person you are. Um, and you'll note afterwards when you're reviewing that video uh, that that question wasn't very good, so the answer that you got is probably a load of nonsense. Okay, the big one. Where do you get users from? Well, uh, it depends what kind of research you want to do. The simplest uh, place to get users from is the desk next to you, and that can work really surprisingly well. So at Flow, we definitely test on people in the office. Our poor old account director and our PA, they get tested on a lot of stuff because they're very useful people, um, because they're nice. They don't think about interaction all day, so they, they're sort of got cleanish brains. Um, you can get them from the canteen, so that's really good. You can, if you work in a large corporation, you can intercept people who don't work in digital in your canteen and offer them a bar one in exchange for 15 minutes of their lunch break. Um, you might well be able to dig users out of your forums or uh, out of your, uh, yeah, those sort of feedback customer service type areas, which can be very useful. And then the kind of cleanest, crispest way to go and get potential customers who are somewhere out there in the world is using market research recruiters. So there is a whole network out there of people whose job it is to find people to do research. They usually recruit people for focus groups. And if you uh, look uh, and do some, you know, some Google up um, market research fieldwork agencies, you will find people who will probably help you to recruit some target users. You can specify what you want. You know, you want males and females, and when did they last do online banking, and when did they last buy something from Kalahari, and do they have an iPhone, and whatever it is. Um, and they will wheel them through the door for you at exactly the time you specify, and you need to pay them for the, for the privilege, and you also need to pay the user an incentive for rocking up. And it's nice and easy, actually, once you get the hang of it. So that's the, that's the kind of story of where you get users. Getting users from the next desk or the canteen is a really good place to start. So if you're going to do your first usability test, then you should probably have a go at some hall testing. And hall testing means you stop people in the hall and ask them stuff. And this is an example, actually, of hall testing um, from Mixit. We were trying to work out how a particular nav bar should work, and we had two candidate nav bars and we just walked around to people's desk at Mixit and gave them the two nav bars to try out. And you can see each video that I took there is about two minutes long, apart from that guy over there who had, a, uh, who had an extra, extra problem, so he took a bit longer. But generally speaking, we, we, tested, we tested the nav navigation alternatives in two and a half minutes each. And we did five of those, and we're like, yeah, navigation alternative one is the clear winner, um, and that was great. So that's easy to do, yeah? You don't have to do much. You don't have to organize a great thing with magic mirrors and viewing screens and inviting the CEO and having market research recruiters. Just going around, you and a buddy, videoing what happens if you've got a point to prove about the interaction with your product. It could be good. You don't need working code is another very important point. So in Agile, yes, of course, working code is very, very, very important, but sometimes, you want to get user feedback before you start implementing a feature rather than afterwards. So you can test paper 
there's a great history going back to the 80s of paper prototype testing. Yeah? And in this photo, uh, the guy I'm testing is pointing with his finger at what he would click if he was trying to do such and such a task, and I'm getting ready to flip in the next sheet of paper that will represent the next screen. Now, this one is really important. So the Agile and the UX communities have been wondering about this for many years, and the conclusion seems to be this is entirely possible. And if you have read Lean UX, you will see the details in there. But the idea is every sprint, you're going to be doing some design, and you're going to be doing some business analysis, and you're going to be doing plenty of implementation, but you should also be doing user evaluation in that same sprint, which sounds really hard until you kind of get the idea, which is a usability test or a user research session. It takes an hour if you do five of them. So you say, okay, we're gonna spend, our, our UX person is gonna spend Thursday doing research. They can do three things in that test. They can talk about what did you do in the past, a user, and they can talk about um, here's what we've just made in the last sprint, let's see if we can make that work. And then the future, Here's prototypes and drawings of the stuff we think we're going to do soon. Let's try using that. And you can have a mixture of those three things depending on what the project is doing. So if the project is, hasn't really shipped any user-facing code yet, well, then you can spend your time testing mockups and concepts and, uh, or asking people about past experiences in, in related fields. If the software is pumping out user interface right now, the team is pumping out user interface right now, and you've just shipped some awesome bits, well, you can test it. So, what we're saying is that this gives you the flexibility to, to basically say, um, just get me, like I said, just get me five users every Thursday and we'll think of something to do with them. Which seems extraordinary. So I met a company in the UK who were doing this recently and I said, don't you find that your clients won't pay for it? And they say, no, not at all. Our clients have realised that the cost of getting five users in every Thursday is far less than the cost of us shipping this thing and no customers actually wanting it. They're totally fine with it. So quite interesting stuff. In fact, usability testing <coughs> can be great for helping your clients or your stakeholders to really understand what's going on in the project. Yeah? Stakeholders really love it. So they can sit uh, and watch a usability test either in real time or watch the video afterwards or the best bits. And then they can go through the software like this gang are doing here and say, oh, actually, well, we could you know, generate some new stories and make some changes to the existing interface. Uh, okay, another five minutes left. Um, and they really like that. <clears throat> and to kind of prove that they like that, this is a blog post that um, one guy who watched some of our usability testing wrote. So he, he runs a company called Obox that makes WordPress themes. And we usability tested his site to find out how people are doing buying WordPress themes. And he said, um, the next step involved putting users in, in a room and watching them use Obox. It was one of the most eye-opening experiences of our professional careers. Watching a layman use your product will blow your mind. You cannot even begin to imagine how your users interact with it. And that is typically what CEOs say when they finally rock up and watch a usability test. And that's going to be a bit more of a performance usability test. But typically they're amazed. We had one the other day who said, this thing generates so much blasted value, which was a strange thing to say, but that's what she said. <laughs> so there we go. So what I want you to do then is you need to go and do a minimum viable usability test. You need to find somebody in your team who likes talking to people. It may not be you, I grant you, but it may be. You came to this talk after all. Uh, you need to get one target user. Maybe they're just somebody in the canteen. Maybe they're somebody you will have to get recruited by a market research recruiter. And you'll ask that user to do three things that your software is supposed to be awesomely good at doing. And then you'll record it, and then we'll see what happens. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, Phil. Well, any questions for Phil at this point? Right at the back. Phil, I once found myself sitting between uh, uh, Alan Cooper and Jerry at school while they beat each other up on how to do Jack UX right. And I kind of left with maybe my gorilla UX tactics are okay. Like it's so valuable to see users in the wild. So I think there's so much crazy bias going on in the scrum world where people have product reviewers at the end of a sprint and they say, yep, we did a good job. And then they tell me, we can't watch users. And I say, hey, who in here has a video recorder? 
<laughs> Next time someone's up on your clients, start making recordings of people using your stuff and throw out your product demo <coughs> and just play videos. I know it's sort of uncontrolled, but what do you think of that guerrilla tactic? I think yes, you'd be a bang on the money. Um, guerrilla, this is all guerrilla tactics, really, isn't it? And, and that's, that's great. I think that there's a, <coughs> there's a concern that um, you have to have the right answer and you have to be somebody who knows the right answer and that being wrong is not allowed and that the usability test might go wrong and that things might break and all of those things. And in fact, usability testing is enormously liberating that you can pretty much be certain that everything will break. That's kind of the whole point, yeah? So you usability test and things break and things catch fire and servers fall over and you just say to the user, oh, well, it's a bit broken at the moment. Hang on, we'll just fix that up. So tell me, you've got any kids when you chat to them for a while? Um, and and that's, that's absolutely fine. So they are chaotic. They are chaotic things. And provided you don't bias users and lead them down the garden path and show them what button to press, all the other forms of chaos are fine. Approach them with intelligence. Don't, don't, don't be an idiot, you know? If, if users are doing weird things, try and understand why, but embrace that chaos because that's actually the environment your product's gonna go out into, really, so, yeah. One more question. And use the um, online services where they recruit people and they, they record what they, what they do in the screen and uh, they provide feedback. Yeah, yeah. online services like usertesting.com, Loop11, yeah. and those kinds of things. Yeah. Also, if you've got customers who are far, far away in the USA or the UK and you're writing software down here and you need user feedback, then those remote usability testing services are really, really good. Um, I mean, they're great. Uh, you can have, you can get, you, you can get answers to a question. If you can make a mock-up of something you want people to try out, you can get answers to that in like two hours. The, the trouble is, you can't do it in South Africa because there aren't enough South Africans who have subscribed to services like those. So it's good for overseas stuff. Yep. All right. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you very much, Paul. One in time.